And we welcome you back to our program. As you know, our program each Thursday brought to us by Kaiser Permanente. And today we're going to be talking with one of their doctors about a very important subject, something that, uh, well, it's the word that puts fear into many people when they hear it. That's the word cancer. Joining us today on our program is Dr. Robert Washer, physician in charge, Division of Surgical Oncology for Kaiser, uh, right here in Orange County. In addition to that, he's also an instructor at UC Irvine and has written numerous papers and columns and books on the subject of cancer. Dr. Washer, welcome to the program. Thank you, glad to be here. Good to have you with us today. So, um, you know, we hear about the various things that people die from, and one, unfortunately, is cancer. Mm -hmm. um, nationally in America, how big of a public health problem is cancer? Uh, cancer is a huge problem, both in the United States and across the, the world. Uh, just in two 2010 alone, about 1.5, 1.6 million people will be newly diagnosed with cancer. About 600,000 people will die of cancer in this country alone this year. Uh, and, and as it happens, cancer has recently replaced cardiovascular disease as the number one cause of death in people under the age of 85 in this country. 2010 is a, is a notable year in another respect in that the World Health Organization has declared that cancer has now globally become the number one cause of death uh, throughout the world. You know, it used to be that that was a, a death sentence. If someone we knew or a family member or a friend was diagnosed mm -hmm. with cancer, it was for sure a death sentence. We're hearing more and more cases now of people surviving cancer of all types. Um, what can you tell us about that? Is, is the treatment better? Are people, more people surviving? Yeah, we've made incremental progress year after year. Uh, right now, if you look at all people diagnosed with cancer, uh, at least 65% of all the cancer patients taken as a group are likely to survive at least five years. In most cases, that equates to a cure. So these are, are record high levels of, of survival. So we're making incremental but sustained progress. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you consider cancer prevention, which is, is uh, our topic today, it's been estimated conservatively that at least 60% of cancers, uh, cancer cases could be prevented with lifestyle or dietary modifications. So treatment getting better, need to do a lot more work on prevention. I know Kaiser is very big on keeping us healthy, not having us get sick. Right. Uh, and if we do, then you folks are there to deal with it. And that's where you know, maybe your department might come in in a surgical Absolutely. intervention, as a matter of fact. Well, let's talk about some of those risk factors. I guess the one we've heard a lot about is smoking. I just visually noticed fewer and fewer people smoking these days. It's interesting. Um, the Centers for Disease Control did a comprehensive analysis of, of the cancer statistics that they collect every year. And these statistics go back about 40, 50 years. Every single year up until 2002, both the number of cancer cases and the number of cancer deaths rising year after mm -hmm. year after year. In the years between 2002 and 2005, we actually saw for the first time uh, a decrease in the, uh, the number of new cases of cancer, 1% per year during that time, and uh, just as important, uh, a decrease by 2% per year in the number of cancer deaths. Uh, so the, those are small numbers, but it's a dramatic reversal of trends historically. And certainly a big part of that good news has been the reduced smoking rate in this country. Uh, lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer death in, in this country and around much of the world. But when you look at the details, it's a, it's a little sobering because all of that reduction in cancer risk for lung cancer and cancer death associated with lung cancer uh, occurs in people like you and me, men, because men have stopped smoking in greater numbers and actually women have uh, increasingly started smoking over the past 30 years uh, when it began to be socially acceptable for, for ladies to light up. And so you see the curves for lung cancer death rates slowly decreasing over the last 30 years for men, going up for women and now reaching just a, a plateau, and, and hopefully that number is going to start coming down. But tobacco is the number one cause of preventable death, both from cancer and from other diseases. Is that in, just in the United States or worldwide? Well, uh, the United States certainly leads in, in smoking prevention and in public policy. And in fact, the state, the state of California, uh, is, is a global and a national leader. If you, if you look at the cancer death rates for lung cancer, just in this state, in the 10 years after the, the public uh, uh, ordinances against smoking were put into place, you see twice the decline year for year in lung cancer death rates in this country as you see, for example, in the Midwest or in the, in the southern part of the United States. Mm. 
There are cancers that are specific to men or women, breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men. I think we've become much more aware of these, mm -hmm. at least uh, we hear more about it, both, both of those from, for testing and, and early detection. Right. Well, lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer right. death for both men and women in this right. country. Prostate cancer is the number one cause of cancer, or number two cause, rather, of cancer death in men. Uh, and similarly, breast cancer is the number two cause of cancer death in women. Um, so there's a huge awareness, and particularly for breast cancer, you have to give it to the breast cancer community because they have raised more money for research and, and for awareness and treatment than, than any other cancer advocacy group. So there's a huge awareness about these cancers. And, and there are a lot of risk factors that, that uh, apply to those particular cancers that, that, uh, that we could talk about mm -hmm. or, or that people could uh, implement as part of their cancer uh, risk reduction lifestyle strategy. All right, well, let's talk about that. We hear from all of, the, all of our doctors, whether it's cancer or cardiology or whatever, exercise more, eat less, <laughs> watch the fat intake, uh, get your blood pressure checked, get right. that under control. Are these some factors that also are cancer related? Absolutely. And regarding those particular two cancers, breast cancer and, and uh, prostate cancer, uh, the, the biggest risk factors you can't change. Like, you and I are going to be men no matter what. We have a prostate. We're going to get older. Those are risk factors for that disease. Uh, family history is a risk factor for both diseases. For women, it's similar. And by the way, 1% of breast cancer cases occur in men. So it's not exclusively a, a, a female disease. Uh, but nonetheless, female gender, uh, increasing age, which you can't do anything about. Uh, the genes you were born with, a family history uh, of, of similar cancers, those are all risk factors as well. But, but the lifestyle risk factors that are very important, you've mentioned a couple of them. One is still not smoking because it, uh, smoking has been linked to these and other cancers as well. Mm. Uh, obesity has been linked to both cancers. Uh, not exercising separate from obesity has been linked to both cancers. Um, a diet with a lot of meat in it or a lot of fat in it, lots of cancers, particularly the GI tract, the prostate, uh, the pancreas, uh, breast cancer, all risk factors. Uh, for prostate cancer, there's a, a unique risk factor in that African-American men are about twice as likely to develop, to develop uh, prostate cancer uh, as Caucasian men, whereas uh, Asian men are less likely. Uh, um, there are cancer gene mutations that can be inherited. Uh, they're relatively uncommon, but they can increase the risk of prostate cancer and breast cancer in people that carry those genes. I, I think there are actually bigger risk factors for breast cancer, and it's a huge list. And in fact, breast cancer has the, the greatest number of risk factors known for any cancer. Uh, we talked about some of them, uh, but uh, for example, also a woman's personal history of, of breast cancer. If you have a breast cancer once, you're at higher risk of having another breast cancer. Uh, women with dense breast tissue uh, during their younger years, higher risk. Even some benign lesions or growths of the breast carry with them some lifetime uh, increase in the risk of breast cancer. Hormone replacement therapy after menopause, a huge risk factor that, that only began to get a lot of attention in 2002 when a big study, the Women's Health Initiative study, reported its results for the most common type of uh, hormone replacement uh, therapy after menopause. Uh, the longer those drugs are taken, the higher the risk becomes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in general, um, other risk factors for women for uh, breast cancer, uh, early onset of menstrual periods, uh, late uh, passage through menopause later in life than the average person, uh, not having children is a risk factor. And, mm -hmm. and even having children after the age of 30 is a risk factor. Uh, breast, or, uh, rather, breastfeeding is known to reduce the risk of breast cancer, so you can say not breastfeeding is, is a risk factor as well. Um, alcohol is a, is a highly underappreciated risk factor for breast cancer and, and many other cancers. And it's been shown that as, as little as one alcoholic drink per day on an average of, of once a day uh, starts to significantly increase a woman's risk of breast cancer. Uh, so there's lots of things that we can do. Yes. There's some things we have no control over. Absolutely. Our, our sex, our family history, our genes. Right. So we need to be, I guess, more proactive. And I guess that's where the doctors again come in, encouraging us to control these other factors. Uh, if we smoke, to stop smoking, uh, obviously discourage that. But again, I know Kaiser's all about prevention, so um, that's the job of, of you folks to encourage the patients to, to do the right things and minimize the risk. And if I could add to that, uh, the issue of being compliant with current cancer screening recommendations, because there are a number of cancers that we can uh, r reasonably well detect at an earlier stage when those cancers are more curable. 
So for example, breast cancer screening, prostate cancer screening, colon and rectal cancer screening, cervical and uh, uterine cancer screening. We have good screening tests. They won't prevent every single case of cancer, uh, but, but we know we can save lives by detecting these cancers early. Early so diagnosis is, improves, the, improves the chances of, of a good Absolutely. cure rate there, yeah, that's sure. Absolutely. Doctor, thank you so much. You've given us some good background information. I think we're all much more aware of cancer now and some things we can do and some things we at least need to be aware of. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for joining us on the program today. Again, our segment coming our way each, uh, Thursday here on the program from Kaiser Permanente. Number there on the screen if you want to find out more about their good services right here in Orange County. Our program continues right after this.